Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and today we're going to talk about the Birch reduction. Now why do we like the Birch reduction of a benzene ring? The reason why we like it so much is because it has controlled it's a controlled reduction, so we add more H's to C's or something that has, usually C's, let's just say C's, more H's to C's, okay, so in other words, we have eliminated or reduced some of the double bonds within the benzene ring. It can, provides a great deal of control, okay, so notice on the bottom one, I eliminated one of the bonds of the benzene ring, but I did not eliminate all of them I kept some of those double bonds, and I didn't do anything to a carbonyl, right? So that makes it really interesting for us. Um, and usually you'll find that named reactions allow you a great deal of control and make something kind of interesting that we can then go on and react in novel ways. Okay, so why do we like this mechanism? Because it reiterates when you're already supposed to know. All right, so the mechanism, Ooh, my squeaky blue marker. The mechanism is really based off of this idea of the same exact thing you did to form a transalkene from an alkyne, okay? And you'll notice that in this, you have kind of the same reagents in some ways, right? That Those two reagents are the exact same reagents that were used to reduce an alkyne, a triple bond, into a transalkene, and it did it through a radical reaction. Okay, so we like this still. So let me draw this out a little bit. I'm gonna do it with just regular benzene, because I can, without a group. Notice the only reason why I put these here is because R is an alkyl group, and notice that the double bonds form in a different way for the alkyl group than they do for something that's more electron withdrawing, like this ketone, okay? So in this case, I'm just gonna do it with benzene, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and label all the C's and the H's here, just so that you get a sense of what's going on. Okay, and here's my C and H. Basically what happens here is that you have an Na. Now Na in this case, usually when you see Na, you see Na with a plus by it, that's because it's already gotten rid of its one electron. We're assuming that sodium still has its one electron in its valent shell here. Okay, so we have neutral sodium as opposed to the cation sodium. And that one uh, electron does not want to stay on its own. <laughs> right? So it wants to react, and it does. Okay, so here we go. Notice that I have a one-headed arrow here. That's because one electron is reacting. So when I do this, one electron is reacting with that C, because as soon as I add an extra electron to this C, then something has to be broken, and the pi bond is the easiest thing to break. I, form, I do another electron right there, which means that another electron is gonna have to go right here, and ele another electron right there. And I form something that kinda looks like Let's draw all my C's and H's in here. Something that, uh, notice that I didn't play with this double bond at all, so let's do that double bond. Okay, and I formed a new double bond on this side, so there's that double bond. But here I have a lone pair, which is a minus, a carbanion, and a single electron down there. Okay, a carbanion is one of the most astoundingly good nucleophiles out there, because carbon likes to make four bonds around it, so it wants to react. Okay, in this case, what's it, what is it going to react with? Well, if we look at this methanol, right, that O to H group has good hydrogen bonding, okay, which means that it has the O to H group, by the way, the hydrogen bonding would happen with other molecules that are, have O and H's. 
because it's an intermolecular force as opposed to an intramolecular force. But the other thing that's interesting here is that O is a particularly good, uh, has a lot of electronegativity, which means that H is a good partial plus, which means that it's the best electrophile out there. So we're going to take this lone pair and we're going to react it. When it forms a bond with that H, that bond has to break. And suddenly I have two H's on this C. Which is pretty awesome. That's great. I just reduced that carbon because now it has more H's than it did to begin with. But I haven't done anything with this lone electron, which is also like a big minus in space, does not like being alone. So I react it again with another Na. And when I do that, I get one electron going there and just making a pair. my two H's here. I haven't done anything to these double bonds. So keep those there. The only thing I did was I added another electron to the single electron, making it a pair, which makes it a carbanion, which then another methanol is going to come along. and be a good electrophile. And you're going to get, let's see, I'm going to call this, a, can I do this in pink? I guess I can do this in pink. Electrophile, nucleophile, take that lone pair, attack that H, put that uh, extra bond as a lone pair onto the O, and I get in the end. Ooh, that's not what I meant to write. I meant to write that. Sorry. You probably can't even see that. That was an H, not a C. Ooh, there's an H. Here's an H. There's a C. And this C now has two H's on it. Okay, so how does the reduction happen? It's a radical reaction. It happens with Na donating one electron at a time. And the methanol is there simply to be able to give up its H's, which means that it's the proton source. It's the way we get more H's on the ring. Okay? The NH3 is really there as a solvent to stabilize everything else that's going on. Okay. Originally, in the alkyne reaction, the NH3 was a great source of protons, but the methanol actually gets to be an even better source of protons, uh, relatively speaking. So that's what's happening in the Birch reduction. It is a great, uh, great mechanism, a great reiteration of what you already know, and until I see you again, I bid you adieu.